by saying that my name's Rebecca Elizabeth Skinner. I don't know why it's saying Catherine Skinner, which is the <laughs> name of my younger, or my daughter, who, so it's, it's a little bit distracting. Um, <laughs> and I um, went to some of the uh, original um, counterculture lab meetings and I, I uh, you know, fondly recall that the first person who explained gram negativity uh, to me was Patrick de Hasselier here. And um, so I'm, I'm delighted to be presenting at um, Counterculture Laboratories, an idea I had originally in 2017. And I wrote to the, uh, to the California Air Resources Board about this idea to their research concepts, um, open, uh, open solicitation of ideas and never heard back from them. And then about a few weeks ago, it occurred to me that I should take this idea uh, up, up again. So I'm just going to read my first paragraph. Uh, micro red mitigation, a proposal to deploy existing adsorption technologies for air pollution mitigation using commodity uh, granulated activated carbon at micro hotspots in numerous locations um, in the built urban environment is a citizen science initiative into a cheap, universally accept uh, accessible approach to air quality enforcement challenges in dis disadvantaged communities and environmental justice communities in California and, and beyond. And so I'll, let's see, Clay, let's go to the next slide. Now, the thing about, uh, you know, climate change is all the, all the rage these days, but, but I'm a bit concerned with how it's portrayed and often it's portrayed without addressing the fact that, without the, the pollution aspects and the immediate health effects on, on people. And what I'm most concerned about is not, you know, planet Earth or drones, you know, um, you know, drones seeding forests in remote scenic locations, which is is fine, but I'm concerned, or or here we have solar panels in the in the desert. Again, scenic and pretty and polar bears. This is what I'm I'm more concerned with. Um, Honest, honestly, I'm concerned with how how uh, with the the real human impact of air pollution. Only one part of climate change, but a, a disturbing part of climate change. And here we have, you know, the reality for an enormous portion of the people in the world: New Delhi, Karachi, Wuhan. Yes, Wuhan is famous, but also for pollution. And in Europe. Um, in Poland, Sofia, Bulgaria, and in, in Russia, and in the Americas, Mexico City, Los Angeles, and finally close to home, excuse me, West, o West Oakland. Um, so I'm con concerned with the air, quali air quality uh, health impacts, including uh, cardiovascular problems, and most famously asthma and um, COPD and uh, significant uh, significant, um, um, you know, ongoing, uh, ongoing conditions that people live with, but also conditions that people die with uh, all over, over the world. And even in the uh, more privileged nations of the, of the world, um, you know, ongoing health, uh, air quality is a significant problem. Now, what's, what's problematic is that we have uh, in the United States and in, in, certainly in California, we have excellent um, legislation, legislation. We have, you know, legislation that restricts vehicles and vehicle emissions, and unfortunately, it is not enforced well enough. It never will be because it is enforced on the local level as well, it's enforced on national and state levels, but very much it's in enforced on the on the local level, and that's why I think that it's that that an. Uh, would I say I would say um, a ground a ground ground up local locally based way to cheaply mitigate um, air air pollution uh, starting on a, on a local on a local level is is a good idea simply because enforcement will never be good enough and in particular in particular if you pay attention to air quality you pay attention to India on a on a daily basis. This is one place where it could be very, very helpful, and it's also problem. Air quality is also problematic in the environmental justice communities of of California, to which I also pay a great deal of attention. Now, as I as I said, um, national ambient air quality 
uh, pollutants are not the same as greenhouse gases. I'm just going to quickly uh, list them. Uh, carbon monoxide, ground level ozone, particulate matter, lead, uh, nitrogen dioxide, and sulfur, sulfur dioxide, dioxide and have cardiovascular effects and respiratory effects, namely asthma and COPD. And despite regulation, the challenge really is, is mitigation. So let's think of the simplest, cheapest, again, dumbest smart thing that you can possibly do will be to use an existing technology. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking of uh, adsorp adsorption, that is process in which uh, mole molecules of airborne pollutants um, are adsorbed into certain kinds of other materials. In this case, granulated activate, activated carbon, which is, um, which is uh, something that is uh, um, uh, available in all sort all sorts of forms, but particularly on a on a on a commodity commodity form that is already used for mitigation of industrial po industrial pollutants for regulated industries and for household odors like you know your cat box, um, but it isn't used for ambient air in in polluted environmental justice communities. So what I would like to think about is simply getting, the, getting this, this, uh, this stuff and there are various uh, subtleties in what, what you use. Do you use coconut shell or do you use bituminous, bituminous coal and in what, what form? Uh, and th there is, is uh, some complex uh, science behind, behind it, although at a very simple level it, it's almost universally understood and has been understood for hundreds of hundreds of years. Um, using uh, this this material this mater material uh, deployed in um, in boxes and in mesh on utility poles and in other particular forms in areas where there is ambient air into which into which uh, um, airborne pollutant molecules can be absorbed then the, uh, the granulated activated car carbon is removed. It is taken to um, uh, any one of a number of highly regulated uh, carbon regeneration uh, facilities. Um, this is a, heavily, a field that is heavily regulated by both California, by the state of California and by the EPA. And it is, uh, the pollutants are uh, destroyed, um, just are destroyed, are desorbed, um, usually uh, by uh, uh, thermal pyrolysis, pyrolysis, and then the carbon is re regenerated. And this, I believe that this is, is something that would be interesting to test out as a possible way to alleviate the uh, persistent um, health, con health concerns and, um, you know, on ongoing uh, um, non attainment and, and air quality uh, challenges in um, environmental justice communities in, in California. And to this, to this end, okay, to this, uh, to this end, I'm, um, I'm, you know, contact, contacting people in the Bayview Hunters, po Hunters Point where I've already worked on air quality monitoring projects. And I, I reached out to the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project and um, I'm speaking, going to speak with uh, Margaret Gordon and Brian Beveridge about, about that and to see if they could possibly, um, you know, help with, host, with hosting an initial uh, pilot study of how to, how this might be done. I have uh, spoken, I'm, you know, getting ready to ask um, the most sophisticated technical questions that I can can um, bring up, bring up to um, to uh, companies that uh, sell and are licensed to uh, regenerate regenerate um, granulated activated activated carbon. So I'm working on all those things, and um, as we can see by the the success of Counterculture Labs and Noisebridge and many other uh, other such um, such um, you know vital and creative um, you know science uh, hacker spaces. This isn't done alone. So I would like uh, to see if any other people are interested in working on this with me. And this is the first um, this is the first forum in which I've uh, presented this in in any way. And I'd like to hear from other people. That's it. 
Uh, questions? Yes, banana peels that I might slip on, please. I have a question. Sure. Uh, okay, so I just looked up the difference between regular charcoal and activated charcoal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And activated just means that it's been processed to have a higher surface area. Do you know how they process it? Yes, they higher? process it by heating it to at least 400, 400 degrees in the process that uh, removes all, um, VO, all VOCs. No. All, um, all VOCs and any tar or any other impurities. Yeah, that increases the surface area so so that um, any um, any um, get any gases that can be uh, that can attach themselves to the surface of the activated carbon will be able to do so without impediment, so to speak. Yes. So, but how? Oh, oh, I was going to say, how does that? Be uh, burning it, ha burning large amounts of, of it to 400 degrees. How does that, doesn't that impact the, that won't impact the environment if you did a lot of it or would it? <coughs> it's, it's not a wildfire. It's not a, it's not a wildfire. It is done under high level uh, regulated condi conditions and isn't comparable to um, uh, burning leaves or setting your trash on, fi on fire because that's the easiest way to get rid of it. Yeah. Well, so you're not burning the charcoal, right? You're, uh, you're turning yeah. essentially wood into charcoal. Uh, Rebecca, you had on one of your previous slides, it said yes, mostly right. coal-based, is that right? I, th I thought it's it was primarily coal-based. It's, huh. often, it's often coal based. It also can be coconut shell based because yeah. coco the coconut shell based is better for continuing to uh, bring bring in and and hold on to um, to gas uh, gaseous molecules under conditions of higher RH, a higher relative hu relative humidity. There is mm. a wide distinction of different kinds of materials that are that are used, but the the um, the um, the carbon ba carbon based is uh, better for absorbing of, hyd of hydrocarbons and VOCs, and then toxic air contaminants is often they like, which I don't know quite what that is, but yeah. yeah I have a I have a quick question. I Please. know Michael, you had something to ask. I'll go after you. Yes. Sir. Okay. Thank you. So my question is: is uh, what would the setup? Let, so let let's just take a. Um, the environment that you were talking about that you're focused on. Yeah. Um, and what would, what would this capture setup look like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in the environment itself? And, okay. and, what, and, and in what mass would that have to be set up in order to capture a significant amount of uh, pollution that you'd have, let's say, that's typical of um, a large urban area? Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, what, well, I, I would initially, I'm initially thinking about some of the most obvious pollution hots, hot spots in, and I would think in Bayview Hunters Point, it would be on Third, Third Street along somewhere like Palou, somewhere where there's a lot of ve vehicular emissions, then figure, figure out at what height most of the tailpipe emissions from cars that haven't passed their smog check um, would be would be ambient. That is where you could could breathe, breathe them, and then um, then this this granule activated car carbon. Uh, some companies will sell just barrels, which you can deploy in one in one spot, and then move and then have removed uh, after a certain period of time. There is a highly um, developed and well understood. Um, you know, scientific field in terms of figuring out um, at what at what point enough of the um, enough gas enough material has been has been adsorbed onto the granule activated car activated carbon um, container, and then it will have to be taken out and replaced with with another uh, with another one. Um, there are. It's not. It's that. That's not entire, entirely clear to me. However, there are, um, you know, extensive like technical manuals that I've downloaded 
from the Army Corps of Engineers and from the uh, Environmental Protection Agent Agency, various and uh, very and various um, it's various uh, you know such uh, technical materials. It is it is not uh, a, a field of ongoing ongoing mystery. The manner of of its deployment is is something that would be. Um, you know, under understood or subject to dis, to discussion by an expert, but it is not. It's not. It's not an insurmountable technical challenge. Although you did mention that it's typically not used for ambient air. I mean, typically yes. you're you're pushing air through it, right? Yes, but but um, yes, but but if it's if the if the deployment of material of the of the deployment of the carbon is in Close, proxi close proximity to the amb ambient air, you wouldn't have the same um, same uh, uh, speed or pressure of adsor adsorption as you would in in flue gas, for instance, attached to uh, 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 to uh, the output in an in an industrial process. But you would you still have a good deal of air circul circulation, and therefore there should be some manner in in which that adsorption could take place and therefore alleviate, right. alleviate the, the um, ambient aerosol pollution. In other words- it, Although just leaving it in a barrel is not gonna do it, right? You, you'd have to somehow spread it out and expose it to the wind essentially. And... I, don't, I don't know, but I don't think that it should, I think it should be something, something that someone who who's expert in this field should be should say oh yes here's how you do it it wouldn't work as as fast as it would in an industrial circumstance but it still could do very well understood industrial process that could be adapted adopted for the purposes of alleviation of, of you know human pollution as breathed in by humans so yeah, I like uh, it's something that's, that's worth looking worth looking into and discussing and doing some kind of a pilot, etc. And I, so I want to try that and want to figure out how to proceed. Hi, Catherine. Um, I like the the concept. I'm going to put my engineer hat on. Oh, please, please. There's there's been a little <laughs> bit of discussion like on the activated carbon side. Like for me, like hearing the project, I would first kind of like. Think of it as a black box like forget about whatever is absorbing the okay. pollutants but just like i would start at the point of like wondering how much like what's the kind of like critical um pollutant like drop off like how much pollutant do you need to take out of the air to have like a measurable impact that would kind of be like one of my first questions like before we even start talking about like the system and you know like knowing how much we need to take out of the air will then like yeah. kind of influence or like inform um, the system and like how much energy it costs, how many of these barrels we would need, like okay. whether activated carbon is the right thing. But I think my first question is just really around like, what do you need to do to like, how much do you need to drop it to make a difference? Is that number known? Um, well, yes, actually, actually it is. For instance, what you could do is um, go to the Bay Area Air Quality Management District um, um, official uh, official instrumentation site at 16th Street and 16th Street and whatever whatever it is Arkansas Street 10 Arkansas Street in uh, Petrero neighborhood in San Francisco see exactly what the level of um, let's let's say um, ozone or uh, nitrogen dioxide is there on a bad day um, that's quanti quantified and then figure out out how, what you would do to get from a, a red or yellow zone of air quality pollution, so to you know, pollution down to a green zone, which is is highly breathe, breathable air, and there are that that's there's a, there are precise metrics for that, and those would be expressed on the Air Now or Bay Area Air Quality Management District website. Figure out what that that delta delta is, and then um, and then figure figure out. The specific the specific amount of um, amount of those gases that you would want adsorbed onto granular activated car carbon um, in order to to bring it down to, to from the uh, 
yellow into the green zone at a particular spot. And I just indicated the particular spot where those measure measurements are taken. So yeah, I mean, something I think like that. Is that is that is that a reasonable? Does that? I think like that's the that's like the a good approach of like to look at the air quality like um, yeah. monitors and to like see like where they're where they are. Maybe just like take an average over a week or something, okay. and then kind of try to see how much do you need to drop it by to okay. get to like you know like a kilogram or like you know moles of pollutant okay. um, just to kind of get like a general idea of like what scale are we talking about do we need to like have the whole sidewalk lined with these things do we you know is it just like one per block like you know just to start to think about like a scale and um i think when you get to that part then like kind of budgeting and like you know how how does the actual unit look does it go up on a pole is okay. it at street level i think all that kind of stuff like ends up playing out pretty formula for formulaically of like okay, okay, okay we need to get rid of this much this is the rate that we need to reduce it by this is the flow rate we need to have like on our yes. uh, like across okay. our column um so i think like the math there is pretty uh, pretty understood uh, mm -hmm. sounds like a perfect project for like a undergraduate um, college student, you know, like maybe an engineer to like kind of do some of those calculations or to do like some just back of the envelope modeling, maybe. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Who, who's speaking, please? I, um, it oh, this is Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. I just took notes. Okay. Hi, Thank Catherine. You. This is Ramey. Um, and I see it. Heather's hand up as well. Um, and I'd like to ask you, uh, I'm sorry, I was uh, coming in from another meeting. So I like missed most of your presentation, but I know that I wanted to make it um, just in terms of a little background. Um, sure. I am an environmental health person. Um, I am a member of countercultural labs. Um, environmental health person, I did air quality and soil quality and things like that. But uh, I have worked with Miss Margaret and Brian on uh -huh. two separate projects. Um, and I'm pretty intimate with sort of the conditions, like the environmental conditions around West Oakland specifically. And so a couple of questions, um, aside from sort of like the, the actual rate of, of mitigation, um, I guess, what do you, what do you have in mind for, uh, wipe a, B inter uh, sorry, West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I call it WIPE for short. Yes. Um, you mentioned uh, environmental justice communities. How do you imagine sort of like if you're doing a pilot? So one of the big things, I don't know if, did, have you ever, have you had an introductory conversation with Ms. Margaret and Brian? Um, I uh, wrote to uh, Ms. Margaret and she said she was going to try to be here. So, so, uh, and I, I, uh, I, spoken with both of both of them at various other other time other times so um uh since she's not here i'm going to reach out to her and brian tomorrow yeah great great and i guess like i guess one piece of advice would be you mentioned impacted communities environmental justice communities and i would say it would be um based on my experience and obviously working with them to understand sort of like what that means as in terms of a bigger strategy about what this pilot could be okay. and how to include the impacted community. Uh, thirdly, wondering if you are familiar with the Google data that came out for West Oakland? Uh, yes, I am, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. just want to make sure. And then the ACMA data as well? Yes. Okay, cool. And then mm -hmm. last thing, I think I, I think that might be it. I guess my other question was around um, the application for indoor air quality, and if you had already touched on that or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, indoor air quality, air indoor air qu air quality, um, commercial products for indoor air quality is a booming field. It's been doing fantastically since the uh, we started having, at least in California in particular, since we started having dramatic horrifying um, wildfires every, you know, starting every Halloween or even even earlier in 2018, I believe, or 2018 is the ones that I, I certainly remember as being uh, some, some of the worst. So there are tons of commercial products for, for, for that. Um, and, you know, you can be purchased and if you have $800, you can buy a molecule. And if you have $30, you can buy a box fan 
with a MERV screen attached attached to it or something from Smart Air Filters, which is now selling like hotcakes in China. Um, but that doesn't do anything for one people who uh, don't have electricity or can't buy um, you know, several of the, box, uh, the um, fan filters with box, scre box screens um, or and it doesn't do anything for people who are outside or have to work outside a lot of the of the time. Uh, one other thing I, I would like to say, since you asked uh, mentioned that I should um, in, you know include the um, the EJ commu communities. So I asked Margaret Gordon and Brian Beveridge, and I also asked Anthony uh, Khalil, Khalil, and I also wrote to uh, Ahimsa Sumhai Porter and. Um, uh, Aud Bujanan, who she wor she works with, so I I am familiar with the the environmental justice community in in uh, in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. I, oh, uh, I meant I'm uh, sorry. I meant in West Oakland specifically. If you're talking to Miss Margaret and Brian, yes, that yeah. I mean, I, I'm in San Francisco, so I don't I haven't been to West Oakland recently, okay. but yes. And then one last piece of information is the AB six one seven group. I don't know if you've been looped into that. So they've been meeting monthly. I think Miss Margaret and Brian should be able to give you more information. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Heather. Oh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to know what do you do with the activated carbon when you're done with it? Like, I think I have a carbon filter fan in my room, but I think I just throw the filters away. I don't think that's probably the best thing to do. Um, as as I um, indicated, you don't just throw away the uh, the, the the spent uh, granulated activa activated carbon. You ha it is it is um, it is taken to a uh, a facility which specifically um, removes VOC VOCs and other contaminants um, from it under highly regulated uh, con conditions. Um, this this um, issue is um, regulated by uh, both the EPA and the state of California's Department of Toxic Substances Control. It's, it's not just heaved into the, into the water or into, um, you know, um, or in, uh, thrown in a landfill. Yeah. And we're all, th we're all throwing out our, our HEPA filters and that's, that's on, on a, on a, and yeah. since that's being played out over millions of households, that's really not good. Although this, this is a separate issue. Yeah. So then what, do, I don't know, what do they do with, where does it go? I don't know. Yeah, I guess I don't really understand what the EPA or whomever disposes of it, where it goes. Um, it's taken to a, a company that specifically um, handle, it, that specifically sells and regener regenerates um, spent um, granulated activated, activated car carbon and the contaminants are removed and the granulated activated carbon is um, regenerated um, through uh, usually through heat, heating and destruction destruction of of the gas, gases and particles that have been trapped inside inside the granulated activated carbon while it's been out in contact with the pollutants. So they do some sort of chemical process to destroy the pollutants? Mostly high temperature. It? Mostly, but not exclusively high temperatures. Okay, thank you. I think Ronaldo's hand is up. Somebody else's was, but they moved their hand. I don't see them anymore. Yeah, I think, yeah, there was someone else, but then disappeared. Um, but anyways, hi, Catherine. I have just two questions. The first one, uh, going off of what Anya was saying, I, I wonder if there's like a way to model uh, like how much you can actually remove uh, from the atmosphere, like how many pollutants you can actually remove from the atmosphere uh, before like trying to go and build something. Um, and because because this just like as a like a sanity check, because I can imagine that if you have like filters that are in a factory or something that are you know you have the air in a tube or something, and the like some like activated carbon filter. Like the air goes through that, then you know you're removing it from from the thing, the air that has the pollutants. But in the atmosphere, the pollutants are just like chilling right there and won't necessarily like move very fast by diffusing to the places that have activated carbon. 
So I'm just curious, like maybe it would be a good idea to like model, like just like by stochastic processes, how how much we're going to be able to remove from the atmosphere, mm -hmm. uh, given some sort of like setup that you create, uh, some like theoretical prototype. Um, um, I really need to find an, an um, engineer who's in interested in this as a citizen science uh, as a citizen science uh, project. Yes, absolutely, absolutely so. <laughs> okay, cool. Because that, yes, I think that would be a, a good idea to do. Um, and the other question uh, that I was, just came up with um, when talking about the regeneration of the carbon. So, if the carbon is regenerated using like uh, like a lot of heat or stuff like that, I'm curious to know uh, like how much electricity or or gas or whatever that process uses just to like see the like the the net change in pollutants in the air because you might be polluting also by heating um, the carbon to regenerate it. it was just just a comment just to see like yeah, something yeah. of interest to keep in mind just just to butt in i think like the argument there is um you're centralizing like you're centralizing the pollutant source so it's easier to deal with um like at a energy production facility or at the regeneration regenerated carbon facility um so it's like just put a you know put some sort of treatment or capture on the smokestack well, yeah, I guess, but I, I mean, it depends on that. that I guess that's true because in, in this case, why not like just try to put those types of activated carbons everywhere, like in cars and stuff like that. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that it, maybe it's impossible. I don't actually know. I'm just curious because it seems just like it's, it's, it seems easier to capture that air before it comes out than when it's in the air. Uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just thinking about stuff. Um, and I, I guess if, if you're heating up using electricity, you might not have access to um, like the smokestack of the plant that created the electricity. Yeah, I've, I've actually been been wondering about about you know why not to include to incorporate adsorptive materi materials in the form of not necessarily you know mesh or some kind of um, something like Velcro into um, you know into things things like uh you know uh parking lot parking lots at the tailpipe le like level in parking lots which are some of the grossest and most polluted places you can can imagine or the sides of freeways or freeway off ramp off ramps or you know outlet vents at dry cleaners or many many other locations and to incorporate incorporate such um adsorptive materials into the built environment in a way that could be you know, systematically, um, you know, taken taken out and cleaned, and then put up new put up new ones on a on a continuous and rotating basis. But you know, it's it's not done. But that that's that was my original original interest. Mainly, mainly, well, it like was like waiting to cross the, cross the street in San Francisco in Soma at an off ramp where it smells terrible and there's tons of concrete concrete and why can't the the pollutants that are coming out of the tailpipes and when there are people waiting five feet away, why can't there something be done about that on the spot? Yeah. That's that's what inspired the, the entire these entire thoughts. Yeah, yeah Rami, if you'd be if you'd be willing to contact me and discuss it further, I'd be very interested in, in your further thoughts because you're you've obviously dealt with this issue a great deal. Yeah. Um, okay. I, will, I, yes. Um, okay. you can, you can contact me. Um, I don't see <laughs> and, uh, how you go. Sorry? How would I do that? Yeah. I'll uh, put my email in the chat. Okay. okay. I will. Oh, whoops. Okay. It's gmail.com. Okay. I will warn you. I am not the best right now i've been writing like hundreds of emails a day but i think a okay. call would be really good and i can kind of give you a download please um and i would say like in oh sorry i should defer to michael who had his hand up after ronaldo okay okay thank you uh, uh rebecca so heather posted uh in the chat that uh it takes about uh, one pound of carbon to, uh, let's see what you say, uh, 
one pound of activated carbon will remove about one third uh, pound pollution uh, from the air. Have there, have there been any kind of cost projections for such a project on a, you know, on a metropolitan scale like this? Uh, it seem, seems like it'd be kind of expensive. And, and, and uh, in addition to that, uh, wh where typically would the money come from for a, a uh, project like this? Um, that's the thing. I don't, I don't see this as, as a commercial, I, I don't, I envision, envision this as something to alleviate, to alleviate, um, the health effects of, um, aerosol, aerosol pollutants. So I, um, don't under, and it doesn't have any, it, it comes directly from an existing technique, which means you don't have a commercial product coming, coming out of it. What I'm interested in is having having uh, techniques that can be can be um, adopted and and used in a very simple ma simple manner and a for hopefully a formulaic manner in um, you know any polluted any polluted community. So I would see this as, as something that could be paid for by um, communities by something similar to what's called a uh, supplemental environmental project in, by the California Air Resources Board, in which polluters have to pay for um, in for environment for environmental and pollution related um, projects. I see this as, as something that could be uh, done um, paid for by communities by philanthropies. Um, by health agencies, something of, of that sort. Okay, great, thank you. So Michael, one of the things that I was also referring to before was like the AB 617 group, that is legislation and policy that set aside money. Um, I believe it was like greenhouse gases that create that funding and it's through the state. So that's, that's why I, was, I told Catherine to tap into that. Mm -hmm. um, I see. So there is there is policy, and now the question is like what what type of implementation? And the the added thing, Catherine, like it was good good to understand where the idea came from. And I guess like when I asked you if you had seen the Google data and the Aquaman data, what we know is that it's very very concentrated in specific routes. And so if we're looking at West Oakland, right, it's going to be truck routes. And so mm -hmm. right the the I think. When we're ta we talk about the environmental impact, and then we have to think about like the social and spatial impact, and just kind of understanding the potential sites, and like if you were to actually slate potential sites, having all of that in mind would be like a very like that that would be doing like like your due diligence. But I think understanding at the local level, or rather the hyper local level, to understand what are the biggest contributors at a any you know, any potential site. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think that's where, so several community groups after the Google data had come out, they asked me, how do we mitigate? And the best thing that I could tell them was because they were in the middle of these roadways, uh, whether these trucks were, truck routes were legally going through truck routes or not, or going through residential areas, what we did know that the air quality was bad. And so mm -hmm. all I could say was, plant some hedges, you know, because you can't, you're not going to move a children's playground. So, you know, physical blockades and things like that. But that was, and this is where I was talking about the community piece is that anything, you know, if you have something random show up on your street, you want to make sure that you're working with that community very, very closely. Okay. I, my response to that is that I, um, I'm, you know, started thinking thinking about about this this uh, seriously only a month ago. But I've been attending the meetings of the Bayview Hunters Point Environmental Justice Task Force in its inception in February 2016. And when I have my act together on this and can present something, um, you know, I would like I will uh, I will do do so. And hopefully by that point they'll be back to meeting meeting in in face to face. Um, so, so yes, under, understood about the community groups. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the background. Okay. And it's not Catherine. It's Rebecca. It's Rebecca. I don't know why Catherine is showing up, but okay. Yeah. Everyone, yeah. it's Rebecca. Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay. And Heather, Heather, you have a question. Oh, um, 
Well, I'm not sure. An article by the EPA that talks about the costs. Um, however, after review of this article, I realized that they're talking more about uh, monitoring system costs um, and not actual installation of activated car, char, car, char, uh, sorry, car, car, charcoal filters on like highways or something. So I think my, I don't know, maybe it's irrelevant now. But it's there if you want to see how much it costs to monitor the pollution in the air regularly. All right, do we have any more questions for Rebecca? That was a good discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, yes. <laughs> Wait, Rebecca, what is your what is your background? What's your research background? Because I missed all of that. And I apologize if it was oh, sure. if I'm sure. making you repeat anything. Uh yeah. I my undergraduate background's in political science, and then I have a PhD in city planning from the University of California at um, Berkeley. And then in um, you know, after a long he he had he had us in which I was uh, um, caring for my kids, I went back to um, serious research and I realized that, and I devoted myself to air, air quality and um, joined the many labs um, science hacker space and uh, wrote their grant proposal for, um, for a hyperlocal air quality monitoring in, uh, in the Eastern, Eastern neighborhoods. This, this project was funded by the California Air Resources Board and the at the pilot level and then the second grant was approved but has not yet um been been funded so my scientific background background and my knowledge of um, air quality is entirely um informal uh informal however i am i'm highly dedicated to to knowing about this field well rebecca i think you're in the right place especially if it's informal <laughs> this, this wasn't to grill you and i was just very very curious um and like I said, I'm, my background's in environmental health, but I also work in an architectural firm. So, oh, okay. so, you know, this is like, we're all over the place, all of us. And so we welcome these perspectives. Thank you. Oh, Remy, you want to mute there at the end. I hit my space button. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's really nice to, to see sort of like how this idea came about and sort of like where you are progressing. And, you know, it's mm -hmm. nice to know that you're very much at the nascent stages. And I think you know, maybe like figuring out together. I don't know if, if we really tried to do this, but, and it maybe tonight might not be the best night to do it, but, um, you know, Patrick, I think Patrick also suggested we can start thinking about back of the, back of the envelope calculations and kind of like doing that together for fun because okay. it is fun. <laughs> okay. And then, it, yeah, that, and yeah, and I'm familiar with many labs too. And so like, it seems like a lot of our world, worlds are colliding. Uh -huh. Um, so yeah, um, I, I think if that is possible, maybe again, I don't know when the right time would be, but perhaps we can sit and like kind of figure that out together and, and provide some guidance and some pottery <laughs> at that. Okay. Okay. Yes, very much. So I'll write to you. Yeah. Thanks. And also, um, to throw out CCL as a test bed, maybe, you know, we're talking about indoor air quality. You know, maybe there's an opportunity to have like a small installation within the Omni. Um, and I know Patrick, you have some uh, air quality monitors, some homemade ones essentially, just measure particulates, uh, particulate count. But you know, maybe it's kind of like just a quick and easy way to get up and running with some stuff that we already have laying around and you know, start collecting data. Oh, so partic particular data would not be quite as relevant for this, uh, but you want to have like VOC monitors. And I don't know if there's a a good generic and cheap VOC monitor. I'd have to look into that. I don't know the technology. Um, actually, I found an article on Medium. I just posted it in the chat. Um, I'm not. I'm not saying it's a bad at what you're. 
your idea is bad, Rebecca. I'm just saying <laughs> that this article maybe highlights some of the failures with outdoor air purification. And so maybe it's a good a good way to see how other people have failed and okay. Okay, have a, that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that one seems quite relevant. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. And if anybody wants to sort of, uh, you know, join forces and try and come up with at least the back of the envelope calculation, uh, be interesting to figure out sort of, you know, if there is a heavy polluted day, how many kilograms of VOCs are really in the air? And therefore, how many kilograms of activated carbon do we need per, you know, acre, whatever? At, at the risk of what did, okay, so also because I missed like the first 20 minutes, um, Catherine, would you be potentially interested in starting this as like a community meetup? So let's say, yes, well, yes. And so <laughs> did we already talk about it when I wasn't here? I don't think so. No. I don't nope. think so. How would I do, how would I do that? Would it be like every two, we every two weeks, you know, certain at least now on online show up and talk and talk about it and set come some kind of agenda for you know next week frequency wise it would be up to you it could be once a month it could be weekly it could be every you know depending on the cadence that you feel comfortable with um and also i'm gonna defer my my brain feels a little rusty right now <laughs> around membership and things like that but i think it would be an excellent idea because I'm, I'm tracking the arc of your inquiry and sort of like where people could kind of plug in and start, you know, actually, you know, just like Heather posted and they're like, oh, here are some pitfalls. So I think okay. that sort of collaboration would be really excellent, especially because you're in the beginning stages. And, yes. you know, mm -hmm. that would be a really nice space for people to actually join you. Because as I was trying to think about like, when would a next, next date be for everyone to kind of like come together to do that? Just set up a meetup if if that's you know something that you'd like to do. Okay. Yeah, and um, we could even combine it with some of the other ideas that you know Heather has been has been suggesting, for example, mm -hmm. and sort of have a more general uh, meetup on the the topic of of remediating pollution of various sorts. And you know, we could cover air pollution every one every other meeting or whatever. Okay, okay. Ooh, Tim Dobbs with environmental the CPL environmental meetup, sure. justice meetup. See. You know how to make me happy, Tim. <laughs> oh, yes, that's fan that's a fantastic idea. Idea. Um, how how is is a an initial initial um, meeting to discuss how to proceed? How does that go? Yeah. We pick a time on the schedule and uh, we write. Two paragraphs. We put the meet up together and advertise it left and right, and you know. Well, just okay, somebody needs to yeah. be a, like a, a co-host or something on Meetup, right? That's that's all it is. Yeah. If yeah. it's every two weeks, I can do it. I can do it with you, with you, Rebecca, since I have been yes. pitching ideas. Maybe it'll help yeah. me follow through. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. If it's every two weeks, I'd agree. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Heather, Rebecca, if you need background information or like just sort of any kind of advice on environmental justice projects, do tap me if if you want. Um, I'm shall. here as a I'll resource. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I remember, we've done projects in the past on looking at like uh, lead pollution in soil as well. Uh, we would love to do more with soil and water pollution. So there's there's a wide range of topics that could fit under this uh, general rubric. So. So I guess, I think, I don't know how to, wait, so yes. for these things, for Rebecca and I to, so Rebecca and I decide like what, Thursday or something, and then somebody posts an advert, like we post, who posts an advertisement? How do we post an advertisement? I don't know how it works. So putting things on Meetup is easy, and I can, I can make you core organizer on Meetup, and you can just... Uh edit your the content of the meetup whenever you want okay mm -hmm. um okay the only bit of a bottleneck we currently have with doing zoom meetings is that they're currently still in my name so i have to show up and start the zoom meeting at least <laughs> if we want to use our, our usual 
Zoom account. We can always pick a different Zoom room as well. That's not a big problem. Rebecca, which day of the week works for you? Oh, Thursday's the best by far. Oh, yeah. great. That was just a random one I said, but it works for me too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, and Thursdays is a gap in our usual meetup schedule, so that would be good. That's why I picked it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you want to do air quality every other week, and then I'll just yes. do soil or water for the other the other time that you're not doing air quality. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, what is it uh, 630 or do do counterculture lab meetings take place at seven? Is that that seems to be your time? Is that the time? Seven? That's uh, when most of them are. Seems okay. to work well. Okay. And that's uh, not a must have. Okay. So. Okay. Seven o'clock Thursday, CCL environmental justice meetup. Okay. When do you want to do the first one? Um, two weeks from now. So what, because I want, I need to do some more. I have a lot of stuff to do on the, um, on the, on this, but two weeks from now I can do it. I can start. Yeah. Okay. So I can, let me see if I can piece some, wait, what's next week. I could try to piece something together for next week. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. on the 18th and yes. then you'll do the 25th. 25th. Okay. okay. Got it. Okay. Done. Heather, um, does the name like sit well with you in terms of like the angle and the scope of the projects? Um. Yes, I. Uh, it's, um, it's it's kind of a a loaded title a little bit environmental justice often these days gets tagged with um, communities who are unfortunate so i guess i would be worried about it turning into a social science project versus a science project but um we can just roll with it and see what happens Speaking as someone who just started, I don't know, maybe, oh God, it was like two years ago now, but just said, oh, I'll just start a meetup. Um, you should you should name it the thing that you're comfortable with because it'll attract people who want that thing. And, um, you know, it, it took me a lot of tinkering to figure out like, well, how do you say this in a headline that gets, you know, the, actually describes the kind of thing I want to do. So um, I, I think you should pick something you're comfortable with, just my opinion. Right. And that's why I just wanted to kind of like circle back with you on that. Um, as someone who works in environmental justice myself, I personally don't think it's a loaded term. Um, I think it's a very specific meaning in terms of understanding communities that have been disproportionately affected by environmental racism or environmental issues. Um, and it's a very deliberate thing. And, and Rebecca could probably speak about like the planning and uh, the planning behind it and all of like the, the historic racism that went behind environmental justice issues that are the legacy of which that we're dealing with today. And it does fall, the, but burden does fall specifically on uh, black and brown communities and those who are financially disadvantaged. So um, the question is like, I guess like it is sort of like the science and the social stuff. I don't divorce. Uh, the two topics. It's sort of like when we think about community science, if we're thinking about empowering everyone, what does that mean? So it is actually essentially a, a social thing, but we need to bring the science to everybody, right? And so that's just my take on it. And so like, I just wanted to see if you were comfortable with that, or like, if you want to think on it, you know, you'll have some time, there's no rush, but you know, just just putting some feelers out there. And I'll, I'll let, you know, I'll I'll see if Rebecca has any comments to add as well. Um, so, well, I'm looking looking at this environmental justice. Um, as environmental justice is is fine as long as it's I guess indicated that the meetings every two weeks are about community are about specifically designate air qual air quality, and it's clear just from I believe from my present presentation that. My initial motiva motivation is disproportionate, you know, is disproportionate. 
um, 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 exposure to, to bad air, qual air quality on the part of environmental justice communities, i.e. it's implicit in, in what I'm, um, in the, the problem I'm, I'm addressing. So um, it's fine if it's called, if it's called environmental just, uh, justice, um, just mention that, you know, certain of them are about air quality very specifically. Yeah, I guess I well I did approach the water uh, water monitoring from the viewpoint of Flint, Michigan, which is a very similar problem with environment with the environment and African American communities being heavily affected by lead poisoning. Um, so, I mean, no, I get it. Like, I get what you're saying, Ramey. It's just that um, I don't want it to consume the, end up consuming the whole thing and not have any science. That's what my concern yeah. is. It's yeah. much easier to, to talk about these things sometimes than it is to really focus on creating a, like an effective science, scientific program so I, I, that's my concern. I really just want to, I want to focus on the science. Yes, right. there is a problem with um, disproportionate um, society and people of lower income status or of different uh, race and ethnicity being um, subjected to higher pollution. However, um, we can call it that. It's just I'm when I have my week, I'm probably not going to talk about it as much. I'm probably just going to focus on the science. And I think I think that's totally fine. I mean, you set the agenda, right? And so you, you can say, you know, this is grounded in X, Y, and Z, and this is why you know Flint, Michigan. That's why Heather, I focus on like my whole graduate career was around lead poisoning, right? And so, and it was specifically because of environmental justice issues, right? But it, it doesn't have to be, you, you can talk about the science. I talked about the science, right? But I acknowledged where it was coming from and why I was focusing on certain communities versus, another, versus others, right? So for the air quality project that I did with the Exploratorium, right? We were prioritizing hardest hit neighborhoods versus people out in the hills. So they were like, people from the hills were calling me to be like, we want like an air, qual like air quality monitor in my backyard and we're like, nope, Sorry, we're prioritizing like East Oakland, West Oakland, like specific areas. And be like, we really appreciate your interest, but this has to do with environmental justice and sort of like bringing awareness in in different, you know, bringing science and awareness to like different populations, right? And in a much public manner. So that's just like I think you have every right to be like, you know, let's focus on the science. But you know, if if it feels right to you, then you can also say it's grounded in you know these are the social issues, but like. I'd like to focus on the science of it, right? Yeah, so, I would recommend that to you? I would recommend that maybe you and Catherine sort of uh, do some brainstorming on what the title should be. Don't be Rebecca. too obsessed about a title. Rebecca. Uh, it's her daughter's Zoom. <laughs> daughter, OK. Um, yeah, I mean, environmental pollution might be a term that might attract a wider range of sort of scientists and engineers. I, I don't know. Uh, you can also look at some of the um, some of the meetups that other community labs have run on similar topics, and sort of see what kind of uh, angle they've chosen in terms of what terminology to use, and mm -hmm. might be interesting to to get some ideas. I mean, we could always always just start off with that title, and then just you know, if we create a better one, we can just change it. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's a ticket. <laughs> well, I'm I'm certainly excited, Heather and, and Rebecca. So thank you so okay. much for for working together on this. I'm super super excited. Okay. Okay. Yes. So I will I will be ready with an with an with an agenda and a clear statement of what I would like to discuss and uh, discuss for the 25th of March. Yes. Okay. Heather and Rebecca, do you have each other's emails? Heather, um, let's see. Um, Heather, I'm writing to you with my email. Actually, here we go. I put mine in for you. Great. Just 
And uh, Steve and uh, Rebecca, I don't know if you are on the uh, the general counterculture labs mailing list. I am. Yes. Oh, okay. you're on Hotmail. Wow, I'm not the last person to use Hotmail. No, you're not. <laughs> AOL, anybody? <laughs> no, but seriously, for the past like five years, I haven't met a single person who still uses this. So that's nice. We both. Yeah, I have Hotmail. other accounts, but I just like well, uh, Hotmail works, so I use it. A, I use it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So the two of you maybe come up with like a you know a two paragraph description. Yes and ideally a picture to go with it as well. I can put that on uh, on Meetup and I'll give both of you uh, co-organizer access. So once it's up there, you can edit it to your arch content. Okay. okay. I'll have one paragraph ready for that. Okay. Yay, Heather. Yes, got it. Um, I apologize, but I need to jump off. And I wanted to thank everyone for yes. making this happen. Yay. Thank you, Remy. <laughs> Thanks, Remy. Good to see you, Remy. You too. Bye. Good to see you. Bye. I got I to gotta hit it too. So, bye, everybody. Yes. It's bye, been Eddie. a little time. Bye, Eddie. Bye, bye. Bye. All right. So, um, remember uh, elections next week. So, show up and, you know, cast your votes. Bye, folks. Thanks, Rebecca. Appreciate the presentation. Bye, all. Thank you very much. Yeah, for thanks, for, uh, thanks for the talk. Hey, Patrick, yeah. before you sign yes. off, stay on for a moment, because I had a couple of things to talk to you about. Okay. Oh, all right. I'm going to leave, too. Thanks, Rebecca. I'll email you. Okay. Nice to meet you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I will be leaving as well. Thank you very, very much. See you soon. See you, well, probably Bye. next week. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> So uh, let's see, Patrick. Uh -huh. uh, one was uh, it, it came up tonight too, and we talked about this before about the Zoom account. Uh, I was I was going to set up a Zoom account for CCL, but it, it had to be in my name, and I have so many suppliers and other stuff in my name. I was wondering if you could just <laughs> sign up for it since you have access to the credit card, uh, you know, to our credit card, and just set up a CCL Zoom account. Uh, you know, like sort of the basic lowest cost one would be the best. Uh, yeah. To uh, get, you one, know, the services. Probably. One option would simply be to switch the payments on the existing account to to the CCL credit card. Okay. And that's under your name, right? That's currently under my name, but I assume I can... See. Yeah, you can switch it. Yeah, but yeah. I meaning you'll take the responsibility for doing that, right? Yeah, I, I'd rather do that than just setting up a whole new Zoom account and then still having it in my name anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that'd be perfect. Actually, it seems easier. I guess it's hard to say about with the 